Dave Nettle, you might have met him. He worked at Alpenglow for 18 years and I could not do what I'm doing. We couldn't do this without that man. He's getting nervous. Uh, yeah. And he is the hub of, this, of the wheel of this mountain community. And let's give him a big, warm round of applause All and right. welcome. All right, we, we got sound all of a sudden, perfect. All right, people ask me all the time, do you get nervous on these things? The light's a little bright, but uh, I definitely get nervous the same way like stepping up to a big alpine climb or something like that. You just take a breath and you go, this is what I do, so relax and do it. So anyway, so glad to be here tonight. You guys are amazing. And if I squint, those lights are incredibly bright. I've been told to stay within the light, but I might be moving around a little bit. So tonight is going to be kind of an interesting show. It's titled Skiing the Tyrol, kind of blending the magic of Austria. Yeah, I, put, I think just big sunglasses. The blending of the magic of Austria and Italy. Um, but kind of kicking it off, it's, uh, I want to start it with like the questions that I get asked um, and that I've been asked, and you've probably been asked as well. Um, over the years, and some of the craziest ones are like, you know, when you're up on a big wall, how do you go to the bathroom? And I'm like, pretty much the same way you would, you know? And so some of these questions are silly, or like, how does the rope get up there? But the questions that I get asked a lot are like, what are the most spectacular places where you've ever climbed or skied? And Patagonia is certainly one of those. The towers of Saratori, an amazing climb, a beautiful place. Other places in South America, in the Cordillera Blanca. It's a hard question to answer because, you know, I've been fortunate over the uh, five decades of climbing to have seen a lot of beautiful places. This is the uh, west side of the Bugaboos um, on the Hauser Towers. Some of the biggest granite in North America and some of the biggest mosquitoes as well. <laughs> and even further north, up into Greenland, up in the uh, Tazermute Fjord, some amazing granite places. It's like, how do you decide which are the most amazing places you've been? And even uh, up on Baffin Island, um, the, the amazing, almost unreal spires of Mount Asgard. That's uh, Reuben Shelton uh, right in the foreground there by the lake. He's out in New York or Vermont now. Um, but we climbed a beautiful route on Asgard, one of the most amazing places. And in the deep reaches of uh, the Himalaya and the Karakoram, this is Trango Tower. So the, the question is kind of a hard one to, to answer. Um, a lot of times it goes back to Alaska. This is actually on a climb I did with uh, my buddy Aaron Zanto right here in the audience on Mount Forker. But I've been to Alaska about 10 different times and each time you think it's the most amazing place I've ever been. So it's a hard question to answer. Like what is the most amazing place? One question I get asked is like, what was the craziest, most out there, ridiculous thing you've ever done? And that's an easy one for me to answer. It was back in uh, uh, 1990 in, uh, on Mount Logan with my buddy Jeff Creighton climbing uh, the first alpine ascent of the Hummingbird Ridge. And uh, we had packed food for about five days if we skimped and gave it our all. We got pinned down several days by storms and we eventually summited, and by the time we got back to our base camp, it had been 11 days, uh, several of those without food or water. Definitely um, down, this is actually on about day 10, that's my better look right there, but uh, sporting the bomber hat from A16, classic look. So that's an easy question to answer. Um, the other question I get asked a lot is like, if you, if you didn't live in Tahoe, where would you live? And even though I might take a little pause on that, my mind tends to drift to Europe, into the Alps, uh, to places like Zermatt with the Matterhorn and some of the other major peaks I've climbed there. It's just a beautiful place with a great history of climbing, of mountaineering, um, both summer and winter. But within that Europe, my mind keeps kind of going back to what I call the Tyrol. Uh, the beautiful region that's kind of the southern part of Austria, the northern part of Italy, like I said, that kind of blends the magic of both. 
a, a fairy land of rock and snow um, all year round. So this is my technical slide here, and I'm going to try to use the pointer. So for those of you that don't know about the tie roll, um, it's basically, and let's see if we can use this, the North Tyrol is kind of the southern part of Austria, and then you have the Sud Tyrol, the South Tyrol, and also called the Alto Adige, uh, that's Italy. And throughout history, this land has been hotly contested and has gone back and forth between the Austrian and the Italian Empire. France took it for a while. Everybody's kind of scrambled for it over the centuries, and I can kind of see why. The thing that first drew me to this region, though, was the Dolomites. Um, Reinhold Messner had put out a book called The Great Walls of the Alps, The Great North Walls. And one of the great north walls was in this uh, group of the Chima Grande, uh, of the, the Tre Chima, and the Chima Grande was uh, the great north face. And one of the more challenging routes in 1998 was the Hase Brandler route that was still seeing very few ascents at that time. And so that intrigued me, and that's kind of what drew me to that region. And if you're going to go to Italy and you're an American, you've got to, like, show up and, you know, really make a good impression. So this is leaving from uh, the Reno airport, dressed <laughs> to show those Italians. Yeah. I'm going to use a pointer here. I want you to take special note of coordinating the white tube socks with the white T-shirt, tucked in for maximum efficiency. No wasted material on the shorts. <laughs> and the, sporting the mustache that existed until 2005. Yeah, that's... What? Yeah, this thing's been off for a long time. Bonnie Zellers was the reason I shaved my mustache. This is a complete... This is going completely off my menu here. We were skiing up on Castle Peak on a grisly storm day, and my mustache looked like a glacier. And she's just like, why don't you just shave it? And I was like, got it. She made it sound so simple. I had been dared to shave it. I'd been threatened that people would hold me down and shave it. She's just like, just shave it. I went home and shaved it. I was like, ah! <laughs> it has not returned. I even take a razor on expeditions now. Anyway, <laughs> moving back to the storyline. Arriving in the Dolomites that first time was absolutely magic. Um, the spires, um, the, the alpine setting was, was amazing. I showed up with my, my buddy Kevin Daniels, and uh, I think we were maybe a little bit too cocky. We actually hung out in the uh, Lavaredo hut in time to have breakfast, and the hut keeper was like, what are you doing today? And we're saying, oh, the Hase Brandler. And he's like, you're about five hours too late. So we hustled over there, feeling like, you know, we had done some long routes in the Sierra, but we realized very early on that the climbing in the Dolomites was a completely different beast. Um, steep, just very physical uh, climbing, and even though we had gone pretty lightweight, we had our approach shoes and some jackets with us, and we realized it was just too much weight. And it turned out that this hiker was hiking by the base, and I yelled down and finally communicated, like, if we throw some stuff to you, will you take it back to the hut for us? And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. You gotta love the Europeans. So we jettisoned all this stuff and continue to climb a little lighter weight. We kept the ax with a hammer, thinking we were told that you might need to tap the pitons in to make them more secure. But you can see by the one here bending out, there's the, the gear on this route were just basically not that good anyway. I love this one. You don't know whether to clip it or cry. That was one of the fixed pieces of equipment. Yeah. You could just imagine the desperation of the person who hammered in the piton on the piece of wood. Like, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> Watch me, Hans. <laughs> So with the lighter weight, um, moving into the upper part of this route, the climbing extremely steep and technical, um, but we had a blast. And as you begin to kind of get a sense of the, the feel of the rock, the difference with the dolomite versus granite, um, we really kind of fell into a good rhythm. And we topped out, understandably, as it was getting dark. Um, the headlamps were, thanks for the light dimming, uh, the headlamps were actually part of what we jettisoned 
That was bad timing. <clears throat> but we arrive back at the hut sometime in the middle of the night, open the door, and right on the ground were our shoes, jacket, and a thermos of hot tea. And it was like, God, you, Europeans understand climbing. It was a very good thing. So since that time, I've actually been back to the Dolomites and climbing throughout the Tyrol at least a dozen other times since 1998. Most recently, last September, uh, with my buddy Todd Burks, uh, trucky legend here, super hard man, my current rope gun, who uh, you know humors me on these long routes. So we showed up last September in the Dolomites, and uh, if there's climbers out there, do you notice anything unusual about this picture? He had two different shoes. So Todd had broken a toe, broke a toe, broken a toe. He broke his toe like just a few weeks before, and instead of bailing on the trip, he just put a big stiff shoe on the bad foot and uh, continued on. And what was great about this is that there's been this whole revival in the Dolomites. They call it the New Age Dolomiti. And the desperate roots, like the Hase Brandler, still exist, but now there's so many new roots out there that are uh, bolted, steep climbing, but you feel less likely to die as a result of the equipment. And uh, for me, just a wonderful uh, time to kind of bring the whole thing back around from the, the desperate uh, climbs on the uh, Chima Grande to a week of amazing climbing right there in, uh, outside of Corvara in the Dolomites. And one thing that hasn't changed over all the years is the food in the Tyrol. Uh, the blend of the Italian, of the German food, with an emphasis on the Italian, um, is really good. <clears throat> but it wasn't until um, 2011 that I really began to do ski touring in the Tyrol. So I had done, skied in um, Chamonix area, um, throughout uh, France and Switzerland, but this was one of the first Hut Hut tours I did with a group of good friends here in Tahoe. You'll know a lot of them right here in the pictures. And it was very evident, this blend of Austrian and Italian culture. Even the huts oftentimes had two names. You had the Refugio Nino Corse, right? And then you had the Zufal Hutte, you know, like each wanted, <laughs> each wanted to get their name. It's like, nah, 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 nah. Well, yeah, but that was before 1918. Ah, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. But it's, uh, the food at these huts was fantastic, um, a delight. Uh, the eating on the hut hut trips in the Tyrol is a key part of the adventure for sure. And almost all these uh, hut to hut trips that I've done have always involved some sort of a peak, um, whether it's been in the middle or at the end of the trip, that really kind of adds a nice mountaineering twist to the whole thing. And this is our crew in 2011 up on the summit of the Konigspitze, or the Grand Zebru, if you want to put the Italian into it. And uh, just a great way to uh, have a, a, a kind of a culminating part of these hut-to-hut -hut trips. And then the skiing. Um, even in the springtime, the huts don't even open until March, so you're always spring skiing, but you get these wonderful powder um, events that make the skiing fantastic. So since uh, 2011, this little ski mountaineering book that I keep close at hand on my desk has been kind of my menu. Rather than going back and doing the same trips over and over, I've been slowly, year by year, working through all these different hut trips. Most of them, skiers in North America have never even heard of, um, but they're fantastic. They all offer different challenges and um, at this point, I think I've done 13 out of those 21. <clears throat> and it wasn't until last year, last spring, 2023, that I finally repeated one. And uh, I showed up in, uh, this time in Austria, in the uh, very far west Tyrol, with a group of great friends who are mostly right here in the, the row. Yeah, my, uh, my Stubai trip uh, group. And uh, so we went over there to do the Stubai Alps high route, uh, hut to hut trip. We started it off by doing a, a nice ski day and sold in one of the largest ski resorts in Austria, and also famous because at the top of the main lift is where one of the James Bond movies, Spectre, was filmed. 
Um, and here's a shot of four of the Bond women uh, that we saw up there. Actually, they're much cuter than the Bond women. So these are four of our gals there. We've got uh, Laura, Nicole, and uh, Erica, and my gal Rochelle on the right, all gathered up there on the top of the James Bond Spectre scene. So last year, at, this, at the time when we were there, Tahoe was buried with snow, as you know, and Europe was off to a late start. And I have to say, even a couple of the folks on the trip were kind of calling me the week before going, Europe doesn't have any snow. Why are we leaving Tahoe? And I was like, ah, have some faith. I've never had a bad hut-to-hut -hut trip in Europe. And sure enough, a couple days before we arrived, it started dumping. And so instead of being, this was all dirt just a few days earlier. So on the Stubai Glacier, we actually took the lifts to the top and had to wade through like thigh deep snow to start our hut to hut trip. So it was like that fantastic first week of April powder dump in the Alps, total surprise. From the top of the pass, leaving the Stubai Glacier Ski Resort, you then basically launch into the Suitstall Glacier, and it's just an expanse of backcountry skiing that's very easy to get to. Um, but it's also kind of interesting, Let's see if I can use the pointer again. We kind of had to boot our way down, but seven years earlier I had done this Stubai route, and you could ski right down this section here. But the glaciers and the snowpack have been receding at such a rapid rate that you can't even enter that uh, very easily at least without a good 50 feet of air. But we were able to work our way down. We got onto the top of the glacier, and the first turns of our hut-to-hut -hut trip, a uh, five-day trip, started with beautiful boot-deep spring um, Tyrolean powder, and definitely stoked. Great way to start a trip. Nicole was getting a little wacky out there, looking sort of for some freshies on the right, and I was getting a little bit nervous, but she knew what was going on. I was down there taking pictures going, turn left, turn left, now turn left. And she, later, she's like, I totally knew that was a hole. But uh, anyway, you don't want to lose somebody on the first day. Usually, um, this route, you pop over the ridge, you ski down, and then you follow the valley all the way down. But as we were skiing down, I had glanced over and saw this beautiful little alpine bowl that was um, untracked. And so we stopped, put the skins on, and went back up um, and got a little bonus lap in on just this beautiful little area there. Again, you don't go to the Alps necessarily for the great consistent skiing all the time on these hut-to-hut -hut trips. Sometimes you get a mixed bag but we were off to a really good start. And as we got lower and lower down the glacier, heading towards the hut, it was wild to just literally feel how you went from boot-deep wintry snow to kind of a little bit scurfy hot pow to almost like full-on spring conditions, all within this 5,000-foot vertical descent um, down into the valley. And at last, you can see some of the old tracks here where the snow didn't really cover much. But now it's just like spring corn all on the same day. <clears throat> and from there, you just like glide along a little path to the next, uh, to the, the hut. This is the Omberger hut, the first hut that we were uh, going to. And when you get to these huts, you know, the priority, because you've been out there working pretty hard in the sun, is to get something to get your hydration back up, right? Like just a small little beverage to kind of take the cotton out of your mouth. <laughs> and there's uh, Aaron with uh, what the uh, Tyrolians consider to be an Ekleina beer, a little beer, yeah. And then big part of the experience is having that time on the deck eating some great meat and cheese plates and uh, just enjoying soaking up the day. And here's Laura when she said, what are we going to be doing tomorrow? I said, we're going to be climbing up on that peak up there. And she's like, that's where we're going. The plan for tomorrow. It's that simple. Just wake up and do it again. So the next morning, a nice cold, sunny morning, beautiful. Most of the skiers that you see in the picture here are just touring their way, the opposite way that we came and heading over to the Stubai Glacier. 
But we're heading up into the sunshine up there uh, to the Kuashibe, one of the prominent peaks um, in this part of the, uh, the Alps. And there's always a time when you skinning makes the most sense, and then times when just getting those skis off and booting up um, and not fighting the morning crust. And so here we are just working our way up, and eventually you get up to where you get a little better snow coverage, and then finally touring into the high country. And again, just spectacular alpine scenery uh, the Tyrol is famous for. So on the final ridge to the summit of the Kushaibe, um, you actually cache your skis, and that's very typical of most of these hut-to-hut -hut trips. There's what they always call the ski depot, where you leave your skis, um, stash them there in the snow, other groups are coming around. But we happen to be um, kind of towards the tail end of the other groups that were there, and we ended up being the only people heading up to the summit at the same time. So we popped on our crampons, kind of lashed them on there, and headed up the ridge. There's Scott leading the pack, heading up a very easy boot track to the summit. And the view looking off from up high, and the ski resort uh, that we had been skiing at the day before, this is, whoa, that pointer went, whoa. It's a very sensitive pointer. I was warned. Anyway, this whole area is Solden. And if you're not confused at this point, <laughs> yeah. Being a spokesperson for the resort there, yeah, it's somewhere over here. <laughs> yeah. It's not the old laser pointer anymore. <laughs> anyway. But we finally reached the summit of the Kushai Bay. Woo! And everyone's psyched. And you always wonder who carried that cross up there. Um, yeah, it was always amazing. Most of the summits of these peaks have these uh, crosses up there. But this was a very unique time because Laura had pulled me aside earlier and said, I want to pull something special for Aaron, her husband. So we're going to renew our wedding vows on the summit of a Tyrolean peak. And so, and this is basically like, if you talk about walking down the aisle, that's basically what you have to cross. Yeah, you're not going to get cold feet and step left or right. Yeah, you better <laughs> stick to the narrow. So this was completely awesome. So with bouquet in hand and Aaron dutifully trailing behind, um, <laughs> they came up to the summit and I was able to officiate renewing their vows and it was awesome. It was a great moment. Everyone was psyched. And uh, yeah, that was uh, 10 years, right? 10 years and going strong. And here is a little wedding party. Yeah, give them a hand. Woo! So what's particularly appropriate is in German, Kuhscheibe roughly translates to cow shit. <laughs> <laughs> or cow pie, I should probably say. I think this is being uh, broadcast. Yeah, it's the great wedding vow renewal on the giant snow-covered cow patty. It was perfect. <laughs> and then, of course, it gets even better after that, celebrating with some great uh, turns and working the margins. You can see where most all the skiers, you know, head down to one side, and we just kind of kept working the best of the snow, zigzagging around, finding these little hidden pockets off to the side, sometimes having to boot or skin up a little ways to get to them, but always worth the effort. And just there's a happy Laura there after making some great turns. Fun, fun time. And then back to the hut, and again, making time to hang out on the deck in the sunshine and just laughing about another great day in the Alpine. And then the, uh, I guess this was taking the place of the wedding cake. <laughs> and you never know what's going to happen in the next moment. But Aaron's a gentleman, so he did it, Chris Wright. <laughs> so the next morning, we had, uh, were heading off, um, leaving the Amberger hut behind and heading to cross an entire mountain ridge range and onto the next hut. And so for a day out in the mountains, you need to have some good protein and energy. And at most of the Tyrolean huts, they actually, at breakfast, they put out meat and cheese and bread. 
And there's all sorts of condiments, and you know, they expect you to put on a piece of cheese or maybe a slice of ham. This is the classic Tyrolean power bar. It's got about a half a pound of meat and about eight slices of cheese and no condiments. That's it. <laughs> that is your lunch for the day. And here's a nice little shot of the outside of the Allen burger. And again, even though this was the first week in April, it was really cold. The storm that had brought in that nice powdery snow was kind of lingering with the cold temperatures. And so we were bundling up for the, the ski tour in the morning, starting off in the shade. Here's a nice shot of, of Aaron kind of envying skiers as he's making his way down on a split board on hard pack. Doing pretty well. And making our way out of the Sutztal Glacier and making our way up into the, um, the Schwarzberg Glacier. So heading up towards the ridge line. Cold, cold in the morning. And then the sun comes out and it's like the whole day begins again. And you just get this gorgeous sunshine looking up the valley. <clears throat> And on these tours, it's very rare for you to be the only ones out there. You know, I have to admit, it's both, both kind of a blessing and a curse to always have a track into the next hut or into the next peak. But the reality is, it kind of makes the route finding easier if you're doing this, you know, for the first time. But it's really a pleasure occasionally when you have just a completely untracked area. So seeing these groups in front of us, we were pretty sure that they were going where we were going. But when we got up into the upper basin and realized that this, we're going to take another swing at the uh, pointer here. The lay, oh, it stuck it right there. I don't know what that arrow is, though. That's new. <laughs> Tech man, is that going to be on that slide for the rest of the night? All right. I knew, I knew this was going to, there's only three buttons. I couldn't have possibly clicked the wrong one. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. All right, we're going to try it again. So the pass here, but there were no tracks leading to it, which was almost unheard of. So this is a Wildgrat Charte. And Charte, is, I think, means like coal or pass. But after you climb it, you know what Charte actually means. So. <laughs> but we had it completely untracked. And so we started to branch off from the other tours and make our way up towards the ridge line. And uh, we got to pretty much as far as it was practical to go with the skis and the skins. So it's crampons on, skis on the back, and again, a, a real fun part of the mountaineering experience um, in the Tyrol. So here's the crew heading up, rope together. The rope isn't there for safety, it's to keep the smart people from going back to the hut. <laughs> <clears throat> and so we kicked steps up the couloir for a little while, then it kind of got sketchy and icy. But at that point, the summer Via Ferrata, the little iron way, kind of came into uh, view, and we were able to kind of get into some pretty fun, exciting, steep climbing. Definitely take ski touring up a notch, but a lot of fun. And it's great to have Nicole right behind me, because notice every shot she's smiling, you know, as opposed to cringing. So she's my perfect uh, mountaineering cover girl for this. Super psyched, Jack behind, always pumped up, ready to go. Well, seven years earlier, I think it was, I did the Stubai High Route, again with a group of friends from Tahoe, and with one 30-meter rope from the standard coal, I was able to lower everybody down to easier terrain. This time, it looked different, and I actually descended down and it was about 100 feet short, and there were a couple crevasses. So I had to work my way back up, and it's like, we aren't going down that way this year. Again, just showing how fast the snowpack and the glaciers are changing. But we were able to find another little couloir, boot our way down a bit, get to an old climbing anchor, a couple of bolts, and again, there's a smile. Um, able to lower everybody back down the steep part over the Bergschrun crevasse, and onto uh, easier ground below. And this is a great site. You can see a couple little tracks where people have toured up to the top of the glacier, but the rest of that bowl was completely untracked. Very unusual in Europe. And for us, we definitely changed that quite a bit. <laughs>
And again, like before, going from nice wintry snow into some beautiful, nice schmooey snow, a long, long descent, um, about 5,000 vertical feet from the coal down to our next hut. Another great shot, Laura, smushing some hot pow. And uh, this is probably right around April 5th or so. And then from there, you can kind of see the tracks in the background. It's a long glide out, a little bit of waddling up over a small ridge, and then a long scooch down to the, the next hut. Just perched on the edge. Just be these beautiful, we call them huts, but they're, they're like hotels. They're absolutely gorgeous. So we arrived at this one called the Fransen Hut, um, one of the more popular ones there in the Stubai region. Uh, it's been going on for quite a while. And again, one of the first things you need to do is take care of that nagging thirst. And so it was Laura's turn to buy. She volunteered. And so it turned out to be our lucky day. It was a two-for-one day. We had no idea. <laughs> but instead of saying, oh, cool, we'll order half as many, she's like, yeah, sure, bring them all on. We'll take them all. So this is uh, <laughs> Jack and Mike, our professional beer drinkers. They're no quitters. They're going to get through all 14 of them. And, and Nicole is actually not much of a beer drinker, but because of the excitement about the two for one day, she's like, I'm dropping in. I'm going to do this beer drinking thing. She poured herself a, a nice glass, and you could tell it's amateur hour. <laughs> she just sat there for a while, kind of going, I don't get what the big deal is. Nothing's happening. It's like, yeah, you gotta, gotta slow your pour down a little bit, girl. <laughs> And then as the day goes on, the big glasses get smaller and the trouble gets bigger. Um, but it's kind of a fun part of the tie roll. Each little region has different schnapps or grappas, um, everything from pine flavored to flowery. And it's just, it's pretty amazing fruit. Hopefully no vegetables, but uh, yeah, they, they'll, they'll make a schnapps out of just about anything. And... The hut life is pretty cool. You know, you get these rooms. Um, I don't know if it was like um, on purpose or because they wanted to kind of sequester us from everything, but we always ended up with our own room, kind of the American room. And it always felt like kind of a combination of like summer camp and the Waltons, you know, because you're like, good night, Aaron. Night, Scott. Good night, Dave. Good night. Good night, Laura. And you're just like, would you guys go to sleep, you know? And everyone's in their little bunks. And, but it works, you know? It really works. It's a fun thing. And a big part of what makes these huts work are the rules, right? The, the Tyrolians love their rules. And so this is one of the rules that's posted in the bathrooms. And so it's very important to note, and I'm going to try to do the pointer here. That's definitely wrong. Ganz falsch. No, no, don't do that. That's wrong. Although it might work. Uh, you know what? That's kind of okay. That's right. If you've really got a problem. But this is what you're supposed to do. And in, in keeping with... In keeping with, like, staying culturally tuned to Tyrol... As a group, this is group participation, be prepared to take a breath. On the count of three, everyone's going to pronounce the name of this bathroom rule. <laughs> Deep breath. One, two, three. Toy <laughs> and don't you forget it. <laughs> oh. So, after a great evening there, we headed out from the Fransen hut to just kind of go out and kind of do a little search and see what sort of uh, fresh snow might still be around. So now it's been about five days since a big storm, maybe even more, and uh, so we weren't sure we were going to be getting fresh tracks. Lots of people skiing in this area, but we toured up, gorgeous, looking back towards where we had come from. This beautiful high alpine terrain. And as we were looking up, the peak in the kind of the area that everyone is heading up to, there's that arrow again. I didn't do anything. I, I'm just pushing buttons. Everyone generally tours up and hits these two basins. But we were looking over here and it's like, 
there are no tracks. There are crevasses, that might be one reason, but, uh, <laughs> you know, if you kind of avoid those, it looked like a great ski run. So we actually diverged from the main path and kind of set a whole new fresh track up high into this basin and ended up having just this marvelous descent. Um, this is the lower part of it, you can't quite see it, but that's uh, my little crew right on the ridge line just waiting to jump in and enjoy some of this beautiful hot pow in the lower part of the run. And it was kind of fun because you see everybody skinning up the track and I was taking pictures from below, everybody just stopped. And it was kind of like, that must be the Americans. They never follow everybody else. <laughs> They're always doing their own thing. So we just had this great run, um, cruising down. Everybody, big smiles, big grin from Mike there. Loving it. And again, just to kind of go down the road less traveled, you can see from um, up high here, whoop, um, the natural line is just to keep skiing all the way down. But we ended up pulling off to the side, booting up for about a half hour, and then getting into some a whole new goods. And as we got lower and lower, the powder turned more and more to kind of this beautiful, fun, slushy schmoo that was just beginning to fall apart as we were heading to the hut, but just had a great time. And by the time we got down to the hut, it was pretty much game over but a great run, an extra 3,000 vertical of just pretty much untracked with beautiful views. And then back to the hut for a nice dinner time. There's Scott taking his wine pouring very seriously, letting it aerate. And another great meal. Again, like all the huts, the food there is fantastic. Yeah, it, this is not like rice and beans. This is the real thing. And even their desserts, they go way out of their way to make these amazing desserts. You know, makes it hard to keep that flat figure there. But uh, good, good fun. And more trouble. Mike kind of came out of the woodwork. He's kind of like, hey, look what I found, you know. I wonder what this type tastes like. And it was really cool, Tomas, the, uh, the hut warden um, and, you know, who runs the whole thing, came over and spent some time chatting with us and he was really psyched, you know, happy to see Americans traveling over and visiting the Stubai. And actually, and I didn't even notice this until I was putting the show together, but it really kind of shows the influence of the whole Tyrol. Here we are up in Austria in the Stubai Alps and there's a picture of the Tre Cima from the southern Tyrol on the wall, just showing that there, there's always this connection, the magic blending um, Austria and Italy, even in the huts. The next morning we woke up to fresh powder. It happened to be our last day. And in a way it was almost good that we were leaving because the visibility was gonna be very poor. But um, we, uh, we had kind of run out of time. It was time to head back down. We chose to send our packs and skis down when the little uh, uh, cable car, uh, because the day before, there was literally no snow on the ground, and now there was six inches, and that's not good for skiing. And at first, we were kind of wishing we had our skis, but as we began walking down from the hut into the valley, you realize that some of those bushy turns might be a little awkward. <laughs> but still a beautiful walk down into the Oberis Valley, beautiful cascade waterfalls that we pass by, and down to the end of the uh, trail, to the start of the road. You can see Laura pointing. So one of the, the former hut wardens, this guy Horst, who had been up there for like 60 years or something, we had him taking our picture, and every time he'd take a picture, he'd put his finger in front of the lens. <laughs> I had several of these. This was the clearest one. And she's like, no, your finger, your finger. Yeah, yeah. Chick. Mm -hmm. I think he was used to an old camera. It's like, no, you don't, have, there's, you don't have to do that. But what was great is he piled all our gear and some other guests' gear into the back of the truck. There's horse there. And, um, and it was actually our lucky day. Most uh, skiers would have to walk about five miles down the road to get to the taxi. But he's like, I need to take all this stuff down there 
Dave, you're going to drive my car. I'm going to take all the gear with the truck, and I need two people to ride with me. And being an old dog myself, I'm like, I know who's riding with horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, we didn't want to put like Aaron and Mike in the back there. That, would, that picture would have looked awkward. So horse takes us down to the end of the, the kind of the service road, met up with the, um, the taxi driver, and back to the hotel where we had started the whole trip um, and ended on a fantastic dinner. We ended up linking back up with Rochelle and Erica. They had been traipsing around the Alps on their own, and it was just another fun wrap-up to a, a good hut trip. And, uh, and then, actually, Rochelle and I went on to ski uh, uh, two of the huts in the Silvretta route, which was kind of her first introduction to hut skiing, and we had a great time. But there's another side to skiing in the Tyrol. So you probably thought the show was about to end. Um, and that is skiing in the Dolomites in the South Tyrol. And uh, this is uh, actually a trip that we took just, what was it, three weeks ago? This was a spur of the moment trip. I was surfing for airfare for another trip, and an airfare came up to fly to Verona for $500 round trip. The Dolomiti takes um, the Icon Pass, so we're like, shall we go to Italia? <laughs> so the Dolomiti Super Ski is an amazing place. 12 different ski resorts, 12 different valleys, are now all interconnected. You can kind of see the specs up there. One ski pass, 12 different valley resorts, 450 lifts, and tw yeah. You might need more than a weekend trip to get all 1,200 kilometers of trail. Um, and, and it's spectacular. It's, it's amazing, amazing scenery. And uh, so here's Rochelle. We got a little apartment in the Val Gardena in the small village of Santa Cristina. And this was the first time I've ever traveled to Europe in the ski season without climbing skins, beak and shovel or probe. But hopefully the picture tells you that it's going to be a good trip. <laughs> so if you go to the Dolomites, so this is going to get a little bit information kind of heavy, but I get asked about this a lot. If you do go to the Dolomites to ski, the Val Gardena is a great place to base out of, and a great way to, like, day one is to go up into the Susi Alp, or the Sizer Alp, as it's also called. It's easy to get into, and they have the first of the rondas that you can do, and a ronda is basically like just saying a tour. And so the Sizer Alm Ronda, basically you follow different lifts that by the end of the tour, you've skied the entire resort. And they're huge, and it's fun. You kind of have this goal, and you cruise around. So it's a great way to kind of break into the Dolomiti Super Ski. But the tour, the Ronda that everyone hears about and wants to do, and understandably so, is a Sella Ronda. And it basically, I'm going to take another shot at the this thing, oh, there it is. Basically, this is the Sella group of mountains, and you link up about eight different resorts all on lifts. All day long, you're just taking a lift, skiing down into a valley, up a lift, and it takes you around this entire region. And a good tip here is actually from where we were staying, way over here in Santa Cristina, you can bump up and down lifts. That's kind of working now, that's kind of cool. And joining, um, the Sella Ronda. The two colors are the two different directions that you can go. And so the one that I prefer is the red going around in a, in a clockwise uh, direction. And so by kind of supersizing it, you start by going up to the Cicada lift out of um, Ortese, the little village, and you cruise your way around, and finally you join up with the uh, true Sella Ronda. And a lot of people say, well, how do you know where to go? Like, what, I mean, you've got these hundreds of lifts and stuff, and they nowadays have it pretty well signed. And they're, you know, and that one's kind of subtle. And they're like, yeah, but what if you miss a sign? Well, you just go down the lift, come back, and 
go the other way. But most of the time, if you miss the sign, you've probably spent too much the night before at a bar. So, in this picture, there are several clues <laughs> from left to right. It's like, where's the Cella Ronda? It's like, yeah. A lot of fun. The cool thing about kind of supersizing it from Ordice too is that it includes the World Cup route of the Sassalong. Um, both at the, you can either have it at the beginning of your day, but if you do it clockwise, one of the last runs of the day is skiing down this incredible World Cup downhill run. Um, and I love it, the tremor, only for the Braves, yeah. So fun adventure. And the lift system that connects all this is amazing. You have these gondolas that are super cool from like four to 12 people. And it's kind of cool, they have these little slots in the floor of the gondolas that you can set your skis, it's pretty cool. The problem is, if you're from Tahoe, your skinniest skis are probably 95 under waist. <laughs> and most of the European skis, that's their tip. And so on our first time, the door is open, everyone gets out, and Michelle and I are trying to get our skis out. They've wiggled in and they've wedged in. They're like, no, bro, we got it, we got it. So, um, yeah, you don't need fat boards in the, uh, in the super ski, for sure. And they make every millimeter of space count in the trams here. Here we are, packed in here. They always put in the same number of people, and if you happen to have half of them being huge Germans, it feels different. So, <laughs> you're just wedged against the wall. Um, but the cool thing about the Dolomites, there are no lift lines. It, it's unbelievable. I mean, there's a lot of people. I mean, literally, there are no lines. It is a mass. <laughs> and as you begin to go through your vacation there, you learn that there's all these different tactics. You got the edge scoochers. You got the middle chargers. You've got the groups, you know, that scrum like rugby. And it is just a mosh. And then when you get through the gates, there's like the holding pen. It's like... Everyone just wants to get there. And then they're like, where's the person I'm going to ski with? Okay, they're over there. And then there's this like secondary mosh that happens. But it always works because at the end, there's a little slot like a cattle thing and everyone gets in it. And for some reason, it works. But this is what your world looks like. We're in the middle. So see all those? That's just looking left. It looks the same to the right. And all that is converging into a six pack. It's absolutely uh, amazing. And they've got it so dialed with these little gates that when the ski runs come down into a little village, they even have like ski gates for crosswalks, you know? I don't know how this would work in, you know, the Sierra, but uh, everyone piles up and then it's like beep and everyone walks and the cars stop and it works. So anyway, it's pretty amazing. And on the Cellar Ronda, um, the food is amazing. This is uh, at a restaurant um, at the uh, Porto Vescovo, one of the beautiful passes with a view of the marmalada and the entire uh, Dolomite stretching out. Just a light little cheese plate with a cheesy lasagna, salad with cheese on it, and then there's probably some other cheese that's out of the picture. Uh, and the wine, that, that helps break down the cheese. So the Cella Ronda is a great route, highly recommend it, but kind of one of the hidden gems is the uh, is a Gira Ronda, and that's the one that is the um, the gr one that kind of celebrates uh, World War One. They call it the Great War. It was the war to end all wars. Apparently, humanity didn't get that memo, but uh, um, that it's it's pretty cool. And this one is quite a bit longer and involves two taxi rides as well. And the hot pro tip is you want to start this tour. You can start it anywhere around. But where you want to start it is right here at the, um, at the Paso Falzarego on the Lagozoi lift. And you want to be on the very first tram of the day. So there's Rochelle. We're like second in line. We are psyched. We're ready to go. And, you know, we had a few side scoochers try to pass by. And she's like, no, nope. yeah, not going to happen. So we held our position and got a nice early start up to the top of the Lagozoi um, uh, tram. And beautiful view. Once you get up on the first tram, then you can relax, 
because it's just one at a time. So you've got at least 20 minutes before anyone else is coming up. So you can let a few of the hot dogs go zipping by, enjoy the view. They even have a download that as you go through the tour, it talks about historic events and, uh, and places along the way. And again, the signage is pretty self-explanatory. And this time we're following the Grand Guerra um, in kind of that purple direction or maroon direction, red direction, um, which is going counterclockwise. So it's going to basically circle around, join up the Cella Ronda, and then diverge. And it's interesting that in the Italian, the Gran Guerra is the Great War. And in the German, it's Mountain Hunter Tour. So <laughs> a, I don't know. I don't want to get political, but apparently the Germans didn't consider that to be the Great War. Um, Exactly, second place. But what's wild is if you start the tour here, you get one of the longest runs in the Dolomites. I think it's about five miles long, many thousands of feet, and it's perfect morning corduroy. The Italians are masters at the morning corduroy. And so you take off, and you're just gliding and coasting and cruising. Um, nice firm conditions, but very carvable and gorgeous scenery as you're cruising. And it's enough of a, there's a few steep sections where you get your carve on, but for the most part, you can actually kind of like look up and enjoy. It's pretty amazing. There's one of the steep sections. That's getting the carve on. That's good that this isn't a video. This was a snapshot. It caught that one moment where it looked like a good carve. And the scenery as you're cruising through this valley, is, it's really breathtaking. You've got these huge cliffs with ice waterfalls. You're gliding through little summer villages that in the summer are teeming with like hikers and so on. And then just as you glide and it gets flat and you come to a stop, there's a horse-drawn sleigh that's going to take you a mile to the next ski lift. So this is uh, what our second run, uh, lift of the day looked like. <laughs> There's Rochelle making friends with the lift up. The lifty, lifty. But it's super cool. And people even ask me, well, how do you know it's going to be there? It's like, it's always there. Um, that's what they do. So you pay your three euro. They wait a little while until enough people come by. And then you grab a hold and the horses take off and they tow you. It's awesome. This is definitely, definitely the Tyrol. And once you get to that point, the horses kind of veer off and you just let go and you glide right down into the Armentarola uh, little uh, platter lift. And then from there, you're back into the main ski zone up to Pizzarega, which gives you a grand view, looking far off in the distance at the Marmolada. And another, you've gone up to the high point, another 1,000, 1,500 foot descent back down. And this was a point where the two routes, as I mentioned, kind of joined together. You've got the Sela Ronda now and the Guerra Ronda joining together uh, near the little village of Araba. And this is a view looking at um, that north face of the Marmolada, and it was actually right here where um, in 2022 in July, a huge section of the glacier broke off. They were having a heat wave, and it swept down that entire valley. Several people were killed. It was a real big deal, but um, apparently that's not a problem anymore. You can actually ski. I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually ski lifts that go up on this side, and you can see... Oh, I think I just advanced the shot. Perfect. You saw it. Um, <laughs> trust me, it's there. <laughs> so the descent from the top all the way down into the little village of Araba is spectacular. Again, these descents go on um, for thousands of feet and uh, in a couple of miles. Lots of fun. So most of the gates have these little paddle things that open up, right? You know, you go there, you got your little icon thing, and boop, the gate opens, and as you're halfway through, it's beginning to close. It's like, gah! You know, so you want to make sure you're not going in sideways. You know, it'll get you. Well, on one of the, 
little uh, gates like this, not this one. This one you can see was casual. There aren't a lot of people, but we imagine you're in the mosh of the picture that I'd showed earlier, and I'm coming up. Rochelle's like way over there, like she was doing the scooch move. So she's already gotten through, and I had my pass here, so my arm kind of went through first. The gate opened, and then the guy in front of me like backed up, and I couldn't get through, and the gate closed. So of course, I like hit it again. It's whoop! I'm like, sorry, I'm not from here. You can't do a double pass like that. You've got to wait. I think it's like 10 minutes. They figure until you come back down. So here I am in the middle of that mosh. I can't get through. And I've got to somehow turn around with skis and exit. And head down. It's like, I'm sorry. I'm from, I'm from France. I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and Rochelle's over there in the, in the holding pen like, What? So we regroup, but that's the great thing about skiing in the Dolomites, is like, all you gotta do is just be like, plan B. So we cash the skis and go, I think it's time for lunch. So we walked into Araba, a, a couple minute walk, and lo and behold, there's a pizza place with a bar. So we're like, what, a, what an odd opportunity. Let's go check it out. So. We wander in there, and it ended up being like one of these surprise serendipities that you couldn't have planned. It's just a standard little hotel. We get inside, and they've got this like mini museum of all this World War I memorabilia. And it really almost kind of gets to you when you look at what they were working with under the conditions in the mountains that they were doing. Everything is just like rustic and hand-forged daggers. Check this out. This is like the machine gun that they were just sitting up there. Sometimes people that had known each other their whole lives from different villages, just divided by some random political um, boundary, but just really raw. And it just brought home, you know, uh, just, over, just a little over 100 years ago, um, this was taking place in a place that now people from all around the world are coming and having a beautiful time together. So we didn't want to dwell on that too much, so we ordered a pizza <laughs> and uh, had a light afternoon beverage. But it's a great part of, uh, of skiing in the Dolomites and the Tyrol and throughout Europe is lunch is a real thing. You don't just grab a power bar and chew on it or something. It's a sit-down fun occasion and then back onto the slopes, uh, continuing uh, the, the tour. And all that beautiful corduroy that you saw in the morning, that disappears at about 10 a.m. So the first pro tip about skis is if you go over there, either don't even bring your own skis, just rent skis there, because they have the weapons for this type of stuff, because it becomes like shaved ice. Um, it's still a lot of fun, and you learn some survival tactics if you're, if you're from Tahoe. So, this, I'm going to try it again here with the pointer. By midday, all the corduroy has been turned into fluff on the margin from people making turns. So while the locals are carving high speed, you can hear it. It like, <laughs> just sounds vicious. I'm over here in the fluff. Doop, 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 doop. You know, like tiny little five foot radius turns. And it feels like you're skiing in four inches of beautiful powder. Hot tip or just bring narrower skis. So we got to the first taxi in the uh, Malga Chiapel, where again, the taxi drivers are waiting, and you have two options. You can either sit there until he fills his van up, and everybody kicks in five euro, or you just slip him a 50, and he's like, ah, get in, we'll go. And so we had a, our private ride, and it was actually kind of nice. You had a chance to unbuckle the boots and get a little ride, see the countryside in the lowlands, and get dropped off, nice uh, ski delivery. And this put us into the uh, Civetta zone, a whole entire ski area that you could probably spend several days just skiing this one area, and it's just part of the tour. And it's pretty amazing. They've solved the traffic problem in a lot of these villages by putting gondolas in from the lower part of town where they have huge parking and buses. And you're literally going up in a gondola where there's rarely any snow over people's houses. You know, like, hey, hey, you might close your curtains. You know, it's just like right through town. 
It's pretty amazing. And the views um, as you get higher and higher through the forest and then up above tree line, checking out all the little uh, uh, lodges and huts along the way where you can stop for lunch and a snack. And then after several ups and downs through the Chiavetta uh, region, another long descent down into um, the last ta taxi ride of the day. And uh, this is great. It started off pretty casual. We get in the van and the guy's cruising along, but you could kind of tell he was edgy, you know? He kind of gets up behind a car and you could just kind of see that, the hunch of the Italian driver and he's kind of like, whoa! And he passes somebody, a little hairball. And instead of being like, whoa, dude, Rochelle and I are like, yeah, Mario Andretti. And it just like, you saw him sit up and he's like, eh, it's nothing. <laughs> We're like, oh no. <laughs> but that was it. He was on fire. And we are going up and there's, I think, 50 different switchbacks. It's a famous road. And the crowning moment was passing a full-size bus in a tunnel. And we're just like, <laughs> Oh my God, by the time we get to the end, we've become like life friends. <laughs> like, you gotta have a picture. <laughs> He's like, ah, that's nothing, that's nothing. So from there, the final little bit of this amazing tour, this amazing day tour, is uh, up the Fidare lifts. And it's wild because during the day, you've been taking some of the most modern, advanced, uh, aerial tramways, and then now all of a sudden out of the blue, you're on this thing that was probably built during World War I. It's a little wooden two-seater with these little towers, so you get the full spectrum of, uh, of aerial tramway experience. And a great view from, uh, from this area. This is a view showing the great uh, wall of the Chavetta that I climbed on my second trip to the Dolomites in 2000. Beautiful country. And uh, at the top of the lift, there's the Avaro hut, and it seemed like an appropriate time to take a little break, um, kind of sur after surviving the taxi ride. Um, you need to sit down and have a, a beverage and uh, just kind of enjoy the afternoon a little bit before the final descents. And you can see, this gives you an idea, the scope of we were actually skiing on the other side of this, and that was a halfway point. So you're covering huge terrain during these, uh, uh, these Ronda tours. Taking the, the Croda Negra, which is, was the last big lift before crossing into the, the valley where we started the tour that morning, and the view, you can actually see, that's the top of the Lag Laguzoy tram there where we started our day. And it's pretty wild. You're not the only ones on these runs. Some people will just literally take lifts to the Avaro, drink all day, and then ski back to their car. And so you have these huge, like, races where people are trying to pass each other down these, this road, and then all of a sudden you hit an upswing, and everyone just bogs down, and they're waddling. Everyone has different strategies. Side hill, herringbone, take off the skis. People are falling down. It's a great afternoon experience to be in the, in the heart of it all. And the final lift of the day, and you can see by the, the clock there, we're definitely getting close to shutdown time. We've made the most of our day, having several good stops along the way. And it seemed kind of fitting that the last lift of this huge thing is a little one-seater Palma. And so, <laughs> after all this excitement, it's like, <laughs> But the, the last, the last run down to the Paso Falsarego was just a lot of fun, just super casual, late afternoon. And then, especially having stopped for a glass of wine, as you get down to the bottom where all the skiers have like tried to stop, you have these like pothole whoop de doos just to add the final like last little bit of insult to injury and arrive where we started earlier that morning. And I think it's like 65 kilometers of skiing during the day. Great tour. No climbing skins, beacon, shovel, or probe needed. And there's Rochelle and uh, heading back to our rental car. Okay, last little bit. Are there any Nordic skiers in the room? Yeah. Woo! All right. I love it. Well, 
you don't even have, you can just go over this Tyrol region for the Nordic skiing alone. It is amazing. And like I said, not only was this the first trip that I've gone to Europe to ski without backcountry gear, it's the first time I showed up with skate skis. Mm, dangerous. And to give you an idea of how experienced I am at skating, check out the gear. Anyone know what year those were? Yeah. That was the hot ticket, 1992, baby. <laughs> anyway, Rochelle is a very avid skate skier, and I actually really enjoy it. Um, it's the one time I have a chance to really put on tights and own it. You know, it's good. <laughs> but the skate skiing there is great. They have hundreds of kilometers of beautifully tra uh, groomed trails. The scenery is magnificent. Um, and we had toured around for quite a while. We saw this little trail leading off into nowhere. We weren't really sure what the sign meant, um, but we decided, what the heck, it probably means welcome. You know? <laughs> it, it was actually kind of hairball at moments, but for the most part, it was actually this beautiful, long, 15-mile connector linking two villages together. Um, and so I think we saw one or two people total during that entire time and just cruising along, finally getting the skate feeling back on the skinny skis. Yeah! Woo! Thank goodness that's a still photo and not a video. And the Sasalunga, the big peak in the back, is, um, where we had started was at the base of that mountain ba over there, and crossing through um, the Saltria, this little village and ski resort, and finally ending up back at the Alp de Suisse, where we had started our whole uh, Dolomiti adventure. This is the best sign to see, by the way. <laughs> Finished! <laughs> but you get an idea here. Um, this was where we started. We toured around. This was a 15-mile connector. And the best part of this whole tour was that you can take a bus back to the start. So <laughs> that was a good relief. And, of course, a well-deserved, light, cheesy snack after a long workout back at the resort. So, <clears throat> the Tyrol region is amazing. It's got such a rich history of, of culture, of tradition, of blending, um, you know, the heritage of both Austria and Italy. Uh, it's known for the amazing villages nestled up in the Alpine. The food there is fantastic. A lot of it, as you can see here, you recognize, but it just seems to taste that much better um, when it's made in a wood-fired oven there, right in the, in the Dolomites or in Austria. And some food you don't recognize, and you're not sure whether or not to try it. I, has anyone had quark? Yeah? What is it? You strained yogurt. Yeah, you made cheesecake out of it. Okay, that doesn't look like cheesecake, but thanks, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was mayonnaise or ice cream, so <laughs> I just took a picture and moved on. <laughs> and you got to love the way they serve wine. Look at that. That's it. You can get a Cabernet by the gallon and... It's just a little over two euro a liter, which is about what you pay for gas over there. So, pretty, pretty awesome. And the alpine scenery in the Tyrol is, is amazing. Um, this is actually a little shot from the start of the Silvretta route. Um, you can see here it's kind of blending in, that, but that's the Heidelberger hut. That's generally the first hut on that tour. Um, and the skiing um, up in the high alpine, whether it's spring corn, spring powder, um, you get the whole mix. It's, uh, it's actually easy to see why you can fall in love with the Tyrol. Uh, it's just such an amazing place, such an amazing blend of all the things that we love to do. But, um, you know, again, kind of circling back to the question, if you didn't live in Tahoe, where would you live? I actually have to say that I've rarely ever answered that question. I've kind of just said, yeah, ask me another one, because we've, we really do have it made here. We really do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Skiing, skiing with that big blue puddle in the background, it never gets old. 
The, uh, the West Shore big trees, world class. You don't see this anywhere else. We're so blessed with the uh, terrain that we have. The open upper bowls along the Sierra Crest. Um, and the snow, you know, maybe it's not Wasatch, but I'll tell you what, we've got a lot of good snow, and it can de get deep, and it can get blower for sure. We, this is, uh, this is my buddy Reuben Shelton going into the white room right there, yeah. And the terrain is just spectacular around the lake here. You, sometimes you're on a run, and you just got into that groove, and you just never want it to end. And other times, you get to the bottom of a run like this. This was a taken laps with my buddy Aaron Zanto, where you're like, thank God there's a road and it ends, because your legs are on fire. <laughs> there's Mr. Zellers carving up, enjoying the wide open terrain that we have. And here, even, you know, the Alps are great, but down on the, you know, Desolation and Mount Talak, we have a very alpine feel that you can get into some, some beautiful alpine feeling terrain. And the sunshine. It's amazing that we can have some of the biggest snowfalls on record, and yet if somebody says, what do you remember most about Tahoe? It's like the sunshine. It's just an amazing blend that we have. So for me, kind of, it's been, you know, since I first started skiing around here, it's been over 50 years. Um, I have to say, between the terrain, the year-round recreation, the great friends, a lot of them right here in the room, and the amazing community, when somebody asks me, where else? Nope, ask another question. It's Tahoe. All right. All right. Come on, y'all. Let's hear it for Dave Nettle. Hey, you. you. Thank you. <laughs> nice one. All right.